Today, I'm going to talk about hunting C2 beaconing at scale in the modern age. And then uh, after the presentation, I will release a tiny but powerful Jupyter notebook that I have developed. My name is Mehmet Ergene. Um, I'm a security researcher and data scientist at Binalyze. I'm a handpan player and I dance in the hub. And that's me playing the handpan. It's one of the most beautiful instruments, in my opinion, in the world. And I highly recommend. I'm Cybermonk uh, on social media plat platforms, mainly on Twitter. Uh, I have a GitHub repository, several GitHub repositories that I share stuff related to threat hunting and threat detection. And also I have a blog uh, that I post uh, stuff related to threat hunting and detection. I think I have around 30 blogs so far. So I highly, rec highly recommend. For today's agenda, um, I will first talk about current C2 beaconing hunt process, and then um, I will explain the C2 usage in modern attacks. After that, I will talk about the experiments that I, I have done. And later I will propose my solution and um, release the Jupyter notebook. And finally, we will have uh, the Q&A if there is time left, of course. So let's start with the currency to beginning hunting process. And by the way, I can uh, I can mention hunting or detection, and they are the same in the context of this, this presentation. So don't get confused. To hunt the beacon, to hunt the C2 beaconing, um, first we need logs coming from either web proxy or Bro or Zeek uh, or any uh, next generation firewalls, let's say. And this is an example um, example log uh, that we have timestamp, source IP, uh, destination information, the send bytes and receipt bytes. So for each source and destination pair in these logs, we first generate the list of connection intervals, uh, which is the time delta by subtra subtracting the subsequent connections using the timestamp. And we generate the list of data size uh, in the logs. After that, we analyze the time delta distribution and the data size distribution. And if both distributions are uniform, then we say it's more likely a beaconing traffic. And also the distributions uh, should be uh, narrow. On the left, you can see as an example uh, of a beacon with a 60, sleep, 60 seconds sleep and 33% jitter. And if we find the connection interval and produce a list of it, then the count of each time delta, uh, as you see here, is somewhere around 25, uh, I can say. And this is kind of uniform. And on the left, uh, you can see uh, another representation of the distribution, which is the density representation. And I know this is a bit high level and maybe a bit confusing, so I will talk uh, more in detail about this process. To analyze uh, the data, uh, the data size and the time delta distribution, we need to know some statistical terms. And the first one is the percentile. So the percentile is the percentage of values uh, in a data set that are below a specified or specific point. So if we say, for example, 25th percentile, then um, we say it means the value uh, of X where the 25% of the values in that list are below that X value. And as an example, let's say, uh, I think there are 300 people in the conference room. And if we consider the uh, person's age in the conference room, and order them uh, in line from youngest to oldest and take the 25% of the people and find that person. And that person's age becomes the 25th percentile in terms of this age distribution. So that, that's how we calculate it. The second term is the median. Uh, median is basically the middle number of an ordered list. It's not the average. Uh, so when we have a list, we take just the item or the uh, number in the middle, and it becomes the median. Of course, there might be even number of items in a list. Then we take 
the two numbers in the middle and then take the average or use another approach. And 50 percentile, by the way, equals to median. The third one is the median absolute deviation. Um, it's basically the measurement of how this distribution wide or narrow. So to find it, we first need to find the median. So as an example, if you see uh, the, the red number here uh, on the screen, it's the median for us. So we first need to find the median and then calculate the absolute distance between the median and the other items and generate another list. So the second list, the, the second list becomes the absolute deviation list and we need to sort it again from smallest to largest. And then we take the middle one more time to find the median absolution. So median absolute deviation and from that list. So in this case, uh, for this list, uh, the median absolute deviation is just one for us. The fourth term is the mean. Mean is basically the average of a data, data set. As I said, it's not median, so median and mean might be confusing sometimes. So mean is the average of a data set. Uh, mod is the value or the values that appears the most frequently in a data set. So if you have a list, uh, as you see in the example, we have ones and twos that are uh, occurring most. So we say the mod of that list is one and two, but it, uh, a data set does not have to have a mod uh, in it. So it doesn't exist always. Uh, the last one is skewness. Skewness is basically the asymmetry of a data distribution. So what I mean uh, by that is, um, if the majority of, let's say, people in the conference room, uh, using the same example, are older, um, are are quite older, then we can say the distribution is a bit towards left or right. So it's about uh, being majority or not. And to calculate it, uh, there are some, there are there are several formulas, and one of them is Bowley's formula, and the Bowley's formula produces a result using the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles. And the result is um, between minus one and one. And when the result is uh, between one and zero, then we say the distribution is positively skewed. And when it's equal to zero, then we say it's symmetrical. So it's a nice distribution. And when it's between minus one and zero, then we say it's negatively skewed. So using all this information, we analyze the skewness and the dispersion of the data size list that we generated, and also the list of uh, time datas. For the skewness, we, uh, we produced a skewness, skewness score. And if the skewness is um, less in the data set, then we give it a higher score. And again, for the dispersion, uh, we produce a MAD score, MAD is the median absolute deviation. Uh, it's about dispersion. So if the dispersion is small, then it means the dis distribution is narrow and we give it a higher score. And after that, we uh, take the average of these two values basically and give it a final score. And if the final score is above a certain threshold, let's say 0 0.85, then we say it's a weakening traffic. Um, in uh, the Rita is, I think one of, is the first tool that are available op as an open source uh, that uses these calculations and a bit uh, different calculations on top of that and find, lets you find the beaconing traffic. As a final example, to give you a more uh, feeling about what or how a beacon uh, traffic looks and normal traffic looks. And the blue line is the beaconing traffic. As you see, it has a narrow distribution and the median absolute deviation of the list is uh, close to zero. And if you look at the orange line, which is a normal traffic, and it has a wider distribution 
and the median absolute deviation is higher than uh, or it's quite high and somewhere around 100 I think based on the graph so now we know how to analyze and calculate these metrics and find the beacons and let's talk about the C2 usage in the in modern ethics so one of the modern ways of using C2 infrastructure or setting up your C2 infra infrastructure is using domain front, domain fronting. And in domain fronting, uh, the attackers uh, set up their infrastructure. And then uh, let's say the, the C2 host is myevilc2.com, but there is a fronted domain uh, which is provided by CloudFront, AWS, or it can be uh, provided by Microsoft Cloud. Uh, and using this fronted domain, uh, they, config, they configure the beacons uh, to use the front end domain. And the beacon starts beaconing to the legitimate domain, but the traffic, the traffic goes to attack host, the C2 host. And what you see in the traffic logs is that uh, the victim user, the destination host, as the cloud front, not the exact uh, myilc2.com, unfortunately. And the destination IP is. Uh, some multiple IPs that belong to CloudFront. And for that reason, unfortunately, uh, with the current method of C2 beaconing, we cannot easily whitelist or block the destination because it basically belongs to a cloud service provider. And even if you can do that, it, it's kind of hard to maintain. Web services is the second uh, way of using C2 communications. We don't know where the attacker host is because they use uh, public level web service like Graph, Microsoft Graph, or it can be Slack or Discord, uh, Microsoft Teams, anything available. And when we look at the logs, we, we only see uh, the source as victim user or IP and the destination host is the legitimate host and also the destination IP as the legitimate IP of the des uh, of the destination host, which is the, in this case, Microsoft Graph. And for this reason, we cannot again block or whitelist the host because uh, it just belongs to a security as a service provider or cloud service provider. The third way of using uh, C2 infrastructure is malleable uh, C2 profiles. In the malleable C2 profiles, the attackers uh, configure the beacon so that beacon uh, modifies the host header packet when it checks in, and then it puts some legitimate uh, host name there, like Amazon.com or anything legitimate, uh, Google.com, etc. And the only difference is that the IP in the logs does not belong to the destination host that you see, uh, does not belong to the amazon.com in this case or any other legitimate host. And again, for, for this reason, we cannot just block or whitelist the host when it's a false positive because it's just benign. Sox tunneling um, is quite uh, heavily used by the attackers. So SOX tunneling is used um, by the attackers so that they can tunnel their uh, tool traffic to the target network. So in, instead of dropping, uh, let's say, NMAP or evil VNRM, et cetera, those tools uh, onto the compromised host. So they use it from their computer, but they tunnel the traffic so that they can just route all the traffic uh, through that tunnel and then scan all the target network from the compromised host. Um, there are three ways of uh, using SUX tunneling. One of them is using HTTP 101. Uh, Cobalt Strike uses uh, HTTP 101 SUX proxy tunneling, and it requires a small sleep parameter uh, to function effectively. Otherwise, it, doesn't, it either doesn't work or uh, it is so slow. Uh, Another way of using it is used using HTTP2 protocol. And G tunnel is an example of HTTP2 
two protocols or a tool that uses that protocol. It basically uses a single HTTP connection, but in this case, it's not a beaconing behavior because you have just one open single connection and uh, you cannot detect uh, the beaconing in that way. You need to check the duration of the total connection. And I think most likely it's blocked in enterprise environments, at least from my uh, experience. SSH is another uh, method of using SUX tunneling. So again, it's most likely blocked in enterprise environments. You cannot just easily uh, go out to the internet using SSH. And all this tunneling can be done over either the C2 channel itself or a different channel. By different channel, I mean, for example, um, you can have another uh, malicious infrastructure or benign infrastructure somewhere on the internet, and you can just you can use it just for this uh, tunneling method. In memory execution, so again, the attackers do not drop files most of the time, or hopefully, uh, onto the disk. So instead, they transfer the commands and code or tools to the beacon or the C2 channel, and then execute it in the either beacon's memory or a sacrificial process memory. And after this execution, uh, beacon sends the results back over the C2. So using these methods, I have done an experiment, which is kind of hypothetical. So it's not a real life uh, attack simulation or adversary simulation. I basically used SUX tunneling for 30 minutes, HTTP 1.1 SUX tunneling for 30 minutes with a sleep value of two seconds and 50% of jitter. And for the keyboard activity, when I send the commands to the beacon, uh, etc., cetera, uh, I use it um, for seven and a half hours. And I set the sleep 90 seconds and the jitter again, 50%. And for the off business hours, because OPSEC is important, um, I, I set the sleep 900 seconds and again with the same uh, jitter value. So as you see here, I dynamically changed the duration, uh, the sleep value, and also I, I could change the jitter on the fly. So the sleep and the jitter value are, are not static in the beacon. And for in terms of the data transfer, when the beacon is idle, meaning it's just checking in, uh, the data size is 800 bytes with a jitter value of 500. And when there is a command or tool execution, then the data size becomes around 20 kilobytes, 40 kilobytes, or may sometimes more than that. So based on this experiment, um, the method that I explained scores the time delta uh, quite low because here, as you see on the graph, the 25th percentile is 1, 50th percentile is 2, and 75th percentile is 63. And just because of the 75th percentile, uh, the score gets or is generated very low. And it's because I changed the sleep values and the bigger sleep values caused the 75th percentile being a bit bigger than the rest. And if you remember, we were looking for a uniform distribution uh, in the time data, and same for the data size. So we get the score uh, of 0 0.27 for the time delta. And for the data size, even though there were some tool executions, commands ex executions, uh, majority of the data size in the in the logs were uh, quite the same or quite close to each other, and for that Rita or the our methodology uh, scores it as around uh, zero point ninety three, and these are the uh, on the right of the graph. Uh, you see the keyboard activity, so. There's a small amount of 
tool and command usage. And if you remember, we need to put, we need to take the average of these two values, these two scores. And when we apply this methodology using um, this logic in an enterprise, this is basically what we get. So we have around 250 or maybe more than that a beaconing like traffic. And on top of the list, uh, based on the scores, of course, we have lots of false positives because they are legitimate traffic. And the real beacon or the malicious beacon that I have done the experiment with uh, is somewhere around 240 in the list. And its score is unfortunately very low, 0 0.77. And most of the time, this gets overlooked because uh, in in SOCs, uh, people usually tend to look at the first 10 or 20 results and analyze them. So it is very hard to check this traffic and analyze and conclude that it's a malicious beaconing traffic. So my claim is that current uh, methodology of beaconing traffic uh, is not working in many environments just because uh, the logic that we use or we used to use uh, looks for the perfect beacons. But in real attacks, unfortunately, the sleep values or those jitter values are not constant or are not static. So they keeps, uh, the attacker keeps changing it based on their needs. I solved, or at least I think I solved this problem and I'm gonna present it right now. When it, comes, when it comes to the time delta analysis, instead of, if you remember, we used uh, 25th, 50th and 75th percentiles. Instead of using that, I used 15th, 30th and 45th percentiles because majority of, majority of the traffic falls into the 60% of the time delta distribution. And by using uh, these values or these percentiles, large sleep values that I changed during the attack uh, do not impact the scoring. In addition to that, I use jitter as a scoring parameter, but this jitter is not the jitter that the attacker uses. So I take the median absolute deviation and the 30th percentile and divide the median absolute deviation by the 30th percentile and get the let's say inferred jitter in the data. And if that value is below a certain threshold, then I put, I give a score of one. And if it's greater than a certain threshold, then I still give it a kind of higher score, but reduce the weight of it. And in terms of the skinness, this is one of the most important thing that I've discovered. Um, I don't use the skinness for scoring because Using jitter does not mean that the distribution uh, will have a uniform uh, will have a uniform distribution. So because of that, I don't use scheme as anywhere. I apply the same logic to data size analysis, and in addition to the same thing with the time delta, uh, I do one thing more. So during the real attack, the attackers need to send some commands, tools, and execute it in memory. And as I said, it's usually bigger than 20 kilobytes. And in fact, if you use c sharp related tools, they are around uh, 200 kilobytes, I think. Uh, that's what I remember. So this means that if there is a real attack happening in the environment, then uh, in that beaconing traffic, you should have at least one connection with a received bytes higher than 20 kilobytes or 100 kilobytes. It's because beacon receives some sort of command and code to execute. And you can use it, you can use this as a condition and also as a threshold. For example, uh, for a nation state, let's say, if they execute only one command in a day, then you can use uh, as a condition just one. Or if it's a ransomware, then you can use five to 10 or depending on your uh, risk analysis. So I put 
uh, all this logic in total that I called ACCD, uh, ACCD is active, C, uh, active C2 or command and control detector. And this thing will be active in, in 10 minutes. And I put it into a test using the same logic, uh, using the same test uh, that I had. And when I look at the performance of the ACCD, so the same beacon that I used got a score of one and it was uh, on the top. It may not be on the top uh, because we can have, for example, another beaconing traffic on the top with, a, with the same score, et cetera. But still, I'm able to analyze because uh, it's somewhere on, on the top of the list and it's not somewhere at the bottom. Currently, it's, uh, as I said, a Jupyter Notebook. And I'm planning to implement in implement it in Mystic Pi. Mystic Pi, if you don't know, it's a, a Python library uh, developed by developed and maintained by Microsoft. And I've been also working on a machine learning algorithm. Um, I'm not developing or creating a machine learning algorithm from scratch, but uh, I think I have found some machine learning algorithms that can better detect this beaconing activity uh, in the environments. And hopefully I will release it somewhere uh, this year. Finally, a DFIR bonus. So when you find the beaconing traffic or when you know the IOCs, let's say, uh, you can basically generate a time series graph of uh, that source and destination. And by doing that, and if you generate the time series graphic based on the received bytes, because the beacon receives comments from the C2 or the operator, uh, you can see when the attacker or the beacon received the command and since you have the time timestamp of that connection, you can easily pivot uh, to the to the same timestamp or the timestamp around uh, that execution to see what happened in the compromised host. So, in my opinion, this is quite useful because most of the time during the FIR, um, the pivoting into the right uh, timestamp or timeline is quite important to see what happened around something. 